How many of you have ever heard of RISPA? The what? How many of you have ever heard of RISPA? Now, children, if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to 2 Samuel. I know you was expecting me to go to Isaiah, or you were expecting me to go to Esther, or you were expecting me to go to Ruth, or you were expecting me to go to Proverbs 6 chapter. I'm sure that those were the things you've heard. But I'm going to share with you someone you haven't heard. Someone who showed devotion. Someone who showed commitment. Someone who showed the, the care and the compassion and the grief that comes with being a wife and a mother. It's not always peaches and cream, right, Mom? Everyone on Mother's Day is nice to mom. Come on now. Now let me tell you, there's a whole lot more days in the year than just today. This is just the day of reminding who's really in charge. Hello? I'm the head of my house. And my wife said I could tell you that. I might be the head of my house, but she's the neck that turns the head. Hello? She loves me. And she understands me. She understands me where others don't. Where others misjudge me, mistake what I do or say, she realizes what I mean. There was a day, if you have your Bible, 2 Samuel, where there was a battle, a battle between the Gibeonites, the Philistines, the Israelites, and these battles were taking place, and Saul and Jonathan were struck down. Jonathan was beloved of David as no other. David loved Jonathan. They were best friends. They grew up sort of together, and they had a, a bond between them. That bond was a bond like brothers, but Rispa was one who was devoted. She was devoted like no other that we read about. Mephibosheth. Who's ever heard of the cripple Mephibosheth? It means the one who's the disclaimer of idols or Baal. Mephibosheth was being taken away for fear that he would be hurt as a baby. And at five years old, he was dropped. And because he was dropped, he became a cripple the rest of his life. He was the son of Jonathan. Now, there was also another Mephibosheth that was also in the lineage. But we're looking here at the, the woman that we can look at mostly and see, I'm trying to get the words out that are correct here, a woman whose devotion was far beyond her own children, far beyond her own. And there's a lot of names we have for mom. Mother. Usually when around my house someone said mother, it was derogatory. Okay, mother. Some of you, you just, she's mother. She's not mom. She's mother. Mother. Wife. Names that we have for mom. Homemaker. Teacher. Maid. Hello? I thought I'd get something from you guys when I said maid. 
You were thinking, ew. That's dangerous. Cook, lover, referee, rescue squad. Tutor, psychiatrist, taxi driver, and example all put together spells mother. The text points out in this unusual story about a mother with an unusual name. Now, Mephibosheth is a name, if you were to go into the census of America, 5,675,742 names, not one of them are Mephibosheth. The last name Mephibosheth was in Japan in 1600. Known. An unusual lady with an intensity beyond recognition by today's vernacular of the name mother, lover, concubine, wife. Rispa was a mother of example by her devotion. She was Saul's concubine. She uh, was there and bore him two sons. She was a Gentile in the lineage of the Horites. Her name means hot stone or glowing stone. Now think of that. Glowing stone. What an anointing to have the glory of God over one who stands as a rock. How many of you mothers today have had to stand in that place when your son or your daughter has had to go to court or go to trial and you knew that they were right? You knew they weren't guilty and you stood for them and you stood beside them knowing that you weren't going to be moved till the right was done. You've seen your children sick, hurt, and you stood beside them in the hospital and you would not leave till they came out of that hospital or there was a final decision on their life. It's a sad thing when a mother or a father lose a child before they go. It just doesn't seem right, does it, that we should bury our children. It just doesn't seem right. But yet, in my own life, my mother has been there to bury a son that she raised up. His own mother had left him at a bus station when he was 18 months old, along with his four sisters. And my mother came into the family. My dad left the military, and she raised him as her own, along with four daughters. She raised them there in our family. There was, well, no, we never said, oh, he's my stepbrother. We never said, oh, she's my stepsister. We didn't believe that. We were brothers. We were sisters. And when I come to church and I call you brother, I mean it. When I come to church and I call you sister, I mean it. For we're the family of God. And there's no greater family than that. Rispa. Being there in the time that they were in, going through the things that they were going through, it was a reference to her physical appearance, a glowing stone, one who stood strong where others fainted. Most likely, she would not have been 
a concubine if she did not possess some outstanding physical beauty. She had to be pleasant to the sight. In those days, a concubine was normal. Today, it's Abby normal. Get it, Abby, girl's name. Abnormal. Wow, tough crowd. Thank you. One out of 50, all right. But <laughs> this might be why there was a reason for them to think that one of his sons took Rizpah as his own concubine. Such a controversy over such a person. But she was known to have caused by Saul's sin and his broken treaties with the Gibeonites. Saul's actions caused God to send the drought and famine their way. And she suffered with her family for the sin of Saul. I'm giving you a back line here so that you can keep up with me. It's, it's something that you'll need to understand before we go into what I want to say. But I want you to know something. She was a lady of devotion. She did not deviate from where she was as a mother or as a wife or a concubine or as one who had born two sons. And you take this into consideration, known as a red hot stone. Hello? How many of you are going to say today, look at your wife, take this day, you're going to leave this place, you're going to go home, and you're going to look her with that coo in the eye that you got? And say, baby, you just one red hot stone. <laughs> she says, good, put it on my fingers. Oh. You'll get that at 3 in the morning. Hello? Wow, tough crowd this morning, or I'm not preaching. One or the other. I better get to it. Rispa loved her sons, and her devotion to them is in a, an example of devotion that you're not going to maybe want to go through yourself. And it caused her to identify with the suffering and embarrassment that the boys had to put up with, with their father, Saul. She was there by her sons. Her devotion caused her to stay with them during the months of their shame. And family is needed most in time of need. They understand, and their presence is most helpful when one falls. We've seen people fall in the ministry. We've seen families stand beside them when no one else would. And let me tell you something, to have something happen to you and be a minister and it put you in a place of shame, it is the most horrifying place you could ever be in. There's only one place you can go, and that's to Jesus. But they stood by while others reviled. Her devotion caused her to stay with her children, stay with them during the middle of all of this. In verse 10, if you have your Bible, I want to show you something. 2 Samuel, 21st chapter. You thought I'd never get there, okay? Let me go back just a hair into 5, and I'm going to read 5 to 14, if you will. Then they answered the king... As for the man who consumed us, Saul, and plotted against us, that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the territories of Israel, let seven men of his descendants be delivered to us, and we will hang them before the Lord in Gibeah of Saul." whom the Lord chose. And the king said, I will give them. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the Lord's oath that was between them. Between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. So the king took... This light is killing me. Ermoni... The king took Aramoni and Mephibosheth, the two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, 
whom she bore to Saul, and the sons of Micah, the daughter of Saul, whom she brought up for, a, for Adriel, the son of Basilia, the Maholonite, Maholathite. Don't you like the ites? Try saying that with false teeth. It's a tough one. Hello? Hope you don't have them. And he delivered them into hands of the Gibeonites. See, I can get that one. And they hanged them on the hill before the Lord. So they fell, all seven together. Think of that. Seven of them standing on a platform. The levers pulled. All seven dropped. What would you think to watch seven of your family drop at one moment? So they fell, all seven together, and were put to death in the days of harvest, in the first days of the beginning of barley harvest. Now Rizpah, here's where we're going, church. Rizpah, the daughter of of Ai took sackcloth and spread it for herself on the rock from the beginning of harvest until the late rains poured on them from heaven. And she did not allow the birds of the air to rest on them by day, nor the beasts of the field by night. And David was told what Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, the concubine of Saul, had done. Then David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from the men of Jabesh, Gilead, who had stolen them from the street of Beth Shan, where the Philistines had hung them up after the Philistines had struck down Saul in Gilboa. An interesting concept here, church. How mercy relates to the mother's heart. How tragedy tears at a mother when it is seen of her and there's nothing more she can do. Saul had placed their children in a place of derision. The descendants of Saul were to be destroyed because of what Saul had done. But Rizpah, the mother of two, goes out there, church. She loved her sons. How many of you can doubt that? Verse 10 tells us she spread a sackcloth on the land. And there were several reasons for this. Number one, she may be indicating her repentance or the repentance of the land. And number two, she may have used it for a place to lie down. Number three, she may have used it as a tent for shelter. But since it is sackcloth, it's my opinion that it was for repentance and remorse for what? had been done. You see, in those days, they would go into that place of travail and they would wear sackcloth and they would pour ash over themselves. A sign of grief and sorrow. A sign of the worst of things that could happen. Needing rectified and only God could rectify that. And here she was, a mother, ripped apart by what a husband did. Now, here's the saddest part of this all. Many a woman has had to live with grief with a husband who did not serve God. And she bore many things as a Christian in her heart, she loved the man, but in spirit, she grieved for his soul. 
and believed for the day of salvation. Many women have been beaten. I believe it was D.L. Moody. I don't want to say it was, but I believe it was him who his wife was devoted to God. She would go to church and he would get mad. And this man would tell her, if you go to church, you'll walk barefoot. Church was about a mile, mile and a half away. And she would walk with no shoes there and walk back. She'd come home and he would beat her and revile her. She'd come home and the last time anything took place like this, he said, if you go to church tonight, the door will be locked. Don't expect to get in this house. And she went to church. She got there. She began to pray with the people who knew what was going on. They were praying and they were asking God to make a difference. They asked God to help her through that time. Just like Rispa here is in a, a place of derision. She, this lady, she went to church. And she came home, and the next morning, he went to the door, and there she was, half asleep, laying back on the door. And when he unlocked the door and she walked in, she began to make him breakfast. He fell on his face before God, gave his life to God, and became one of the most noted speakers ever in that time and generation. But it took the grief of that mother that lover, that wife, to show him the mercy and devotion and the grace that God has for those who will come to him. Rispa is a type of mercy, a type of solidity in God that we have today. Rispa went out there and she found them on the ground and there they were laying. They were not allowed to be buried. They were not allowed the things that would normally be done and there they are. They're hanging there. They're not of any value to them but it's a suffering and a sinful shame that brought them to that place of hanging. And it's there that Rispa said, I will not be moved. I will stay till the things change and she stayed till the change came could you see this lady Rispa there a, a, a type and a shadow of the delivering power of God and she's right there and the birds would come to eat on them and as those birds came to eat on them she would find herself in a position to where she would have to run up there and whether she had a stick we don't know but she would shoo away the birds all day long she would be there in that heat in that time of the harvest we know that it's hot during the harvest because they're harvesting getting ready for the winter it's not a time that is cool it's a time that is extreme heat and there she was out there in the elements nothing to protect her day and night day and night she would not be moved a mother so loving, a mother so caring that even after death, she would not allow anything to come near her children and cause destruction. Oh, saints of God, if, is that a mother? At night, she would hear the dogs come. She'd hear the things that were happening at the night. She did not care for her own body. She did not care for her own safety. She went there, and she would keep them away. Till David. A type of redemption. Here's. Are you with me? You see, when we pray, God's listening. When we pray, God's hearing. 
When we're in those final hours and we're in those places where we cannot trust ourselves, that's when we can trust God. When we can't trust anything else, we trust God. And here she was in that place where the enemy was going to allow disgrace beyond measure. It's one thing to justify. Is that true? God's a justifier. It's one thing to be justified. But it's another thing to torture those who did nothing. Come on now. Are you listening to me? Rispa would not be moved. Devoted unto her family beyond a measure. It was a real devotion. And sometimes it reveals itself in the form of tough love. How many of you, like me, one day I went up and talking to my dad, and I said, Dad, I think you should have whipped me more. You know, I lived in a day where you got whippings when you did wrong. And you know, there may have been a lot of negative things that took place because of the things we did, but eventually it becomes a positive life. Because we learn that there's a consequence. And isn't that what we learn as a Christian? There's a consequence. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he reap. And if a man does sin, a man is liable for the sin he commits. Isn't that interesting that Jesus said, no more. No more. It's finished. I'll take the scourging that they deserve, Father. I'll take that scourging. You ever have a kid say, I know what I want for breakfast. I want candy. And you said, okay, here you go. Just to spite my daughter-in-law one time. <laughs> one time. <laughs> I actually, she came to get her daughter. And her daughter says, I had ice cream for breakfast. So I'm like, you dirty rat. The look on her face was worth a million. But sometimes we need to teach them right from wrong. And there's consequence. Yesterday I was with my grandchildren. And they have these machines. We went to Winco. And how many of you know if you put a quarter or a dollar in that machine, you're going to get ripped off? And so you just walk by those machines, don't you? But kids don't walk by those machines. Some have a fit. I've watched it. Any of you seen it? They're there on the floor screaming, yelling. Mom's embarrassed. Grabs him by the foot. Drags him out. No, I'm teasing. But my granddaughters wanted to play it. One of them was you can play till you win. My one granddaughter, yeah, I'll play that one. I'm going to win every time. The other one, I love her. I love them both, actually. Don't get me wrong. But she decided she was going over to the one with the bigger stuffed toys. And how many of you know Satan's like that? He brings something good, something big, something rich. To steal your joy. And she tried three times. And I hear someone going, you wasted three dollars. It's my dollars. I sold a car. Anyway, 
she earned those dollars by scraping pieces off of the floor in my house. And we were rewarded with going and playing the machine. And she put it in that one machine with the big stuffed toys and she missed. And she missed. And she missed. Finally, she goes over and plays the one where you win. We get into the store. And someone says, why are you telling us this? Well, hang on. We get into the store, and I got 10 minutes left, okay? We get in the store, and all of a sudden, I look at her, and she's moping. Anyone ever seen their grandchildren mope? She's moping. I said, what's the matter, baby? And she goes, I wanted the stuffed toy. And I said, you blew it. I said, we could have took that, went to Shopco, you could have got a stuffed toy, but you wanted to try to win it for a dollar. And so you put three dollars in where you could have went to Shopco and bought one. Church, where are the lessons we're teaching our children? And how are we applying those lessons to life? Nowadays, teachers are teaching our children that it doesn't matter whether you win. Everyone's a winner. That's the biggest lie there ever came. How in the world can that be? And then when a child goes to a place where they lose, they don't understand that they're not a winner anymore. And that's the biggest lie and hurt that you could ever give a child. Let them learn it young. And they'll gain a greater sportsmanship, a greater demeanor, a greater character. And so anyway, when she told me that's what the teacher said, I wanted to go in and slap the, the teacher. Because you know, our children are the most important treasure God gave us. Our grandchildren are a treasure. Some of us wish we'd have had them first. <laughs> but I look at it this way. Here's Rispa out there in the worst time of life. But she never let go of the value of life. The value of life. In the end, we see that she's blessed in a way that we can't understand it as blessing. But I want you to know that she insisted on many things, but one thing she didn't insist on was that they let them go. She grieved inside herself that they would be let go, but they weren't. A mother goes through many things. They say that when a mother gives birth, it's the closest to death you come. I don't know if that's true or not, but I've heard that. Is it true, moms? I know if I was going to give birth, I'd want to die. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> oh, Lord, take me now. <laughs> but we need to look at Rispa and see that every mother devoted to her child will do what it takes no matter what. And that is devotion beyond measure. I could have told you about Ruth and Esther and the virtuous woman. But this morning, I want to say this. Mothers, I commend you. For you have gone through atrocities you've never wanted to go through. You've gone through sicknesses. You've gone through broken bones. You've gone through all the things your children have gone through with them.
and for that, I can never commend you high enough. Because what you did, you did for love. And if you did it for love, you did it for the right reason. Stand with me. Two hundred years ago, a, na a lady named Susanna Wesley reared 19 children. And she was devoted to the task and had 16 rules. And here's the rules as they follow. Eating between meals is not allowed. As children, they are to be in bed by 8 o'clock. They are required to take medicine without complaining. Subdued self-will in a child working together with God to save the child's soul. Teach a child to pray as soon as he can speak. Require all to be still during family worship. Give them nothing they cry for and only that which they ask for politely. To prevent lying, punish no fault which is first confessed and repented. Never allow a sinful, never allow sin to go unpunished. Never punish a child twice for a single offense. Commend and reward good behavior. Any attempt to please, even if poorly performed, should be commended. Preserve property rights, even in smallest matters. Strictly observe all promises. Require no daughter to work before she can read well. Teach children to fear the Lord. And Rispa is an example of some rules we ought to have today. She kept the vultures and the wild beasts away. And we need to do that in a spiritual way for our children who are out there. I won't get into all of that I have left unless you want to stay longer. There's the beast of drugs. There's the beast of abortion. All of these different I was going to get into, but time prevents. But teach your children well. Take your grandchildren in your arms and only do that which is right in the sight of the Lord. Teach them well. And in all prayer and hopefulness, things won't go wrong. But when they do, thank God for a David. His name is Jesus. Because when all else fails, he'll give a comfort. Oh man, I'm going to cry here. Jesus will give comfort when the heart is broken and the heart is hurting. Jesus will give comfort. Would you bow your heads with me?